Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us on yet another edition of Three O'Clock with Sock. Please just give me a second so I can welcome our Spanish speaking neighbors onto the conference call for Spanish interpretation. Hola, gracias por estar aquí con nosotros hoy en este día soleado que tenemos. Eh, espero que todo el mundo se encuentre bien. Um, como siempre, ustedes pueden acceder a nuestro foro comunitario en español a través de una llamada de conferencia y pueden ver el número de teléfono que aparece aquí en la pantalla. El número es 571-317-3122 y cuando contestan la llamada van a introducir la contraseña que es 437-949-1242. Y voy a dejar el número ahí para ustedes por si acaso no pudieron acceder uh, hasta ahora. So thank you for giving me just that second to welcome our Spanish speaking neighbors onto the conference call. Um, and again, thank you for being with us today. We have a really great program for you all with our uh, lovely health commissioner, Jeanette Kowalik, and the deputy commissioner of, um, uh, sorry, I forgot. The, um, it's not on here. Sorry about that. Of um, um, the deputy director or commissioner of um, environmental, uh, well, Claire Evers will be with us and she'll let us know what she is. I'm so sorry for forgetting that. Um, I was trying to find it on our thing. Anyways, thank you for being with us and they are gonna share a lot of really great information with us. Um, as usual, we are in solidarity with protesters that are not only protesting against the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, so many countless people who have lost their lives, but just protesting structural violence and systemic racism and police brutality that exists in our, in our systems across the board. So we stand in solidarity with you and our heart goes out to all of those who are affected by police brutality. We are also, um, our heart goes out to those who are impacted by COVID-19, especially uh, those who have suffered a loss of, by COVID-19 and those who have fallen ill. Our hearts go out to you and our thoughts and prayers are, are with all of you. Um, we also just wanna let you all know that you can reach us in all of the ways that you have before, minus in person, because we are still practicing uh, staying as safe as we can. So you can reach us at 414-672-8090 and uh, our email sock at stockmilwaukee.org and our website www.stockmilwaukee.org. So with that, I am going to let you all, or I'm going to introduce our uh our coronavirus coordinator, Marlene Zabran, and she will then invite our guests on for the day. Thank you all for being with us. Make sure you comment and let us know you're here and that you are excited to hear from our guests today. And any questions that you all throw on the comments today, we will try to get them answered by our, by our amazing guests. So I will now welcome on Marlene. Hey. Hi. Thank you for that introduction, Gabe. Of course. Um, so, uh, like Gabe said, today we're going to have Jeanette, Dr. Jeanette Kowalik, the Commissioner of the Public Health Department and the Deputy Commissioner of, the Environment, of Environmental Health for the City of Milwaukee Health Department, Claire Evers. Um, First of all, I'd like to welcome all our guests, and um, I hope you're enjoying the day. It's a really nice day outside, you know, social distance, but go outside. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to start off um, in solidarity with current protesters and families and individuals that have been affected uh, by protests um, and police brutality during this time. And also our thoughts and prayers do go out to those that have been impacted by COVID-19, those who are ill, uh, currently ill, uh, and those who um, have passed away from COVID-19, unfortunately. Uh, so 
today I'm going to uh, introduce now with us, we'll, we'll have uh, Dr. Jeanette Kowalik first, uh, and she's going to kind of give us a macro level of the COVID-19 status in Milwaukee. Hello, Commissioner Kowalik, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, of course. Uh, we always like to hear your advice and expertise, um, especially since you work for, you know, public permit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I am immersed in this work because of the uh, nature of it. Again, we had our first case on Friday the 13th in the month of March. And at the county level, there's over 10,000 cases now, and the city has about uh, 8,000, a little bit over 8,000 of those cases. So, and then as far as people that have passed away, it's about, it's over 300 now. Um, and then the city level is about 200, a little bit over 200. Um, but initially, as I noted last time I was on, or the first time I was on, we were seeing a disparity in COVID-19 cases and fatalities in the African-American community and how that's shifted now to the Latinx or Hispanic population in our town. Um, and how, when we first saw this, we were like, what's going on and started to investigate and how we were seeing some relationship to where people worked, uh, to uh, where they, um, you know, do you see some linkage there? And then of course, you know, once it's in the community, it spreads quickly. So um, just some of the work we've had to do uh, with other businesses and just other community partners uh, getting the word out like SOC, for instance, and 16th Street Community Health Center and giving out masks and educating people about the risk of COVID-19. Uh, we did see recently though that a number of younger people uh, have uh, been reported to have uh, cases or their cases of COVID-19, uh, young people under the age of 15. So we again wanna just highlight the risk is real that just because the focus uh, initially was older people, people over 65 and people with underlying health conditions, that just because you're younger and you don't fit those categories doesn't mean that this should not be an issue for you. That one, this is a new virus, so we don't know if there's any long-term effects or disability that might come out of being exposed or having COVID-19. And secondly, um, you may be a carrier and expose someone to the virus that may not be able to survive it. So just knowing that we have to look out for one another as a community and what we can do to prevent being exposed to COVID-19. So we're just, again, messaging the need to wear a mask, um, a mouth covering, you know, covering your nose to your chin, uh, making sure you're using proper hand hygiene, that you're washing your hands. Um, if you have access to a sink or if you're out and about using alcohol sanitizer, that's 60% volume or higher. Uh, thankfully, sanitizer is more accessible now than it was earlier on in the outbreak. Uh, so people should be able to have access to it. So we've been working on getting donations and getting uh, masks and sanitizer out to the community through the community partners. And then our work, of course, at the health department through um, our Office of Violence Prevention, the 414 Life Group and all of that. Um, but uh, just educating folks about the risk, especially our young people knowing that um, you know, COVID-19 is, is here, it's real, and we just have to be vigilant about protecting ourselves and our community from being infected so that we can move beyond this point in time. I know it's been uncomfortable and an inconvenience for many of us, but I mean, everyone's been impacted worldwide. So it's not like, you know, this is something unique to us. It's just um, how we're handling it and really trying to move beyond. Um, just overall, I think our areas considering that the biggest population in the state is doing a reasonable job considering the circumstances. What I mean by that is how there was limited access to testing early on, as well as limited um, masks, PPE, personal protective equipment, and just how the messaging has changed um, coming from the federal or the national level to the state, to the local, to us, where we've had to make adjustments in our messaging many times because we're running more information about the virus. So now that there's more access to testing, there's more access to masks, there's more access to sanitizer and just, you know, adjusting the message uh, that we're not focusing on stay home, save lives, 
that we're focusing on how can you be safe when you do what you have to do. Many of us are essential workers, so we have to be out and about and maybe exposed just by being out of our house and the type of work that we're doing. So uh, Deputy Evers or Evers can talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the community with businesses to make sure that there's some protections there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also um, using these five indicators to kind of guide how we move into different levels of orders. Since the city of Milwaukee still has an order because we have the most vulnerable population, uh, we have a, an obligation to protect our public. So our um, key performance metrics or indicators are fivefold. Uh, we have cases, testing, care, safety, and tracing. Mm -hmm. And these are similar to the county ones. It's just the city ones are more specific to our contribution to progress. Um, so for cases, we're looking at uh, we're looking at statistical significance of 14 days. Uh, if it's either going in the right direction or the wrong direction. Uh, and then a positivity rate or a positivity rate of 5% or less. That's the goal. Right now we're between five and 10. So we're in the middle there, which isn't too bad considering testing is up. Mm -hmm. As far as testing's concerned, um, we're, our goal is 2000 tests a day or less than five positivity rate. Uh, and we're in a set, like I said, we're in the middle on the positivity rate, so seven. I don't have the updated number for tests right now, but it was a little low once all of the protests and demonstrations started uh, after Memorial Day, but now the testing's back up. So that's great. So people can get tested, especially if you've been protesting or you're exercising your right to um, of freedom of speech that you should get tested. Right. Uh, care and safety are related to the hospital system. So how many hospital beds they have, safety's access to masks and gowns or personal protective equipment or PPE as we call it. And then the last one is tracing. So that's the health department's contribution. So how quickly can we get a hold of you if you're a positive or you're a contact of someone that's positive? So we're looking at uh, within three tries, we're successfully able to contact you or make a connection. So 95% uh, is our goal. Anything less than that to 50% is in the middle and then anything less than 50% is in the bad. So we've been in the middle, um, higher end of that right now. So we uh, are preparing to make an update, a formal update tomorrow, if we're gonna move into the next phase of our orders, phase four, which will allow things to open up a little bit more, but still with caution. So I'll hand it over to you, Deputy Evers, Evers. Hi, thank you. Um, so I was asked today to talk a little bit about um, the rates of illness in the um, Southside community. So I'll just go over a couple numbers first and then um, go on from there. So the zip code that we have seen the largest number of cases on the South Side is 53215. So there are a total of 1,896 confirmed cases in that zip code. Um, and the majority of that population is Hispanic. The second highest number of cases is a neighboring zip code 53204 and also 53215. And so there have been about 1300 cases in the 53204 zip code. Um, so the cases among the Hispanic population has increased from 16% to 40%. And the Hispanic community is now the most heavily impacted by COVID in the city of Milwaukee there have been um, just over 3,000 confirmed cases in this community. Um, and the group has now um, ha unfortunately had more cases than the African-American community, community to date. Um, I was also asked to talk a little bit about where we are in phase four right now. I mean, I'm sorry, phase three right now. Um, so phase three, um, right now we are allowed to be open a little bit, as the commissioner said, with caution. Um, that includes restaurants and bars being able to be open at 25% capacity. Um, there are some pretty um, defined safe business practices that they must adhere to. Um, there's an exciting pilot program that we're developing right now. There will be more information coming out about it tomorrow. Um, but basically, it is a very detailed and thorough COVID safety plan 
that if an operator wants to expand operations without a capacity limit while still complying with um, social distancing and the other requirements, they could submit a plan to the health department for approval, and then they could operate without a capacity limit. Again, there'll be more information coming out about this tomorrow, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that the health department um, is continuing to do research nationwide about best practices and how we're learning how to live with this virus in different ways. Um, an example of this also is some sporting um, sports groups are figuring out how to play their games differently to limit contact, to limit the, the potential spread of the virus in order to be able to still have these types of organized sports. So we're continuing to look at best practices and develop programs to have our community be able to be engaged safely. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight during today's conversation is what we're doing to help businesses stay safe and what to do if they do have a, um, a COVID positive employee. So we have a system in place where if someone identifies that they um, their place of employment and they are COVID positive, we have a staff member reach out to that business to start a consultation with them to talk about what their COVID prevention measures are. Um, we talk about if they have a mask wearing policy, if they have um, staggered start and stop times, and we try to figure out um, what their practices are to ensure that they're, they're doing the most safe, safe processes as possible. Um, if it turns out that the outbreak is getting, uh, that they're getting an outbreak, meaning that they have two or more cases of COVID, we then do an on-site assessment. So we'll actually have a staff member go there and walk through the, the establishment and provide suggestions on how they could do better for COVID safety. Um, so I just wanted to share that the department is um, being very proactive, working with businesses to ensure that employees are also protected. Early on in this, um, pandemic response, a lot of the notifications of outbreaks came from employees. We're very grateful that they we were being contacted to follow up on outbreaks across the city. Uh, we still encourage people to do that if they um, feel that there is uh, their boss or their, their place of employment is not operating safely. We do encourage them to contact the health department so we can support employees and businesses to operate um, the safest way possible. So thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming on and sharing all of this valuable information. Um, I have just one more question. Um, either one of you can answer this. Um, but how do you feel contract contact tracing um, has had an influence on individuals with mixed immigration status? How do you feel that impacts? You know, oh. Yeah, that's a great question. This is where community partnerships are completely uh, clutch because we know as a health department, we're part of government, right? Even though we're not like the federal government or state government, we're still, you see government, it, it includes all of us. So we do acknowledge that that may create some issues by perception that we're affiliated with um, harm or anything like that. So we know that uh, contact tracing and being able to su successfully establish a connection with people is going to be challenging for us because of some fears and concerns. And we have been seeing de uh, declines and um, utilization of some of our services at our clinics uh, through our maternal and child health group. So we've been monitoring that for over the last year. Mm. I talked about this at the uh, Latino Health Summit last year, and I plan on talking about it again this year, but it got canceled because of COVID. But, you know, looking at like WIC, for instance, or um, just immunization clinic, um, or access to like the home visiting services and things like that, we were starting to see some pretty significant declines. So this is where the community uh, organization aspect is really important because you know, there's relationships and there's uh, uh, trust built up with working with organization X or Y. You know, we're we're all in this together. It's all about the greater good. So we don't necessarily need to be the one doing everything. We want to make sure it's getting done. So we'll continue to work with others and support. 
them in a variety of ways to do that, whether it's giving them some funding, you know, providing some technical assistance and support. So we have been doing that with 16th Street, for instance, mm -hmm. been really successful. And I know that they were able to scale up testing and access to testing way early compared to other um, groups, including, you know, our health department and yeah. partnership with the National Guard. We also know that that's an issue too. Um, that is great. The National Guard has an arm that does medical stuff, but mm -hmm. them by them seeing as police or having police power or some type of authority that there may be a perception that people in the community don't want to go to those sites because they don't trust them because they're the ones running it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did see that decline in testing uh, within the first week of the protests and demonstrations. And we figured it was related to three things that one, who's staffing the site, the National Guard. Two, if people are out protesting and demonstrating, they're out protesting and demonstrating, so they're not going to get tested. And then the third thing is more so related to like perception of risk. If the news switched and all of the media attention is going towards protests and demonstrations, Black Lives Matter, uh, police brutality, you know, abolishing, you know, all of that that that's the focus. So there's very little discussion of COVID. So people may be like, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Right. So uh, we've been working on trying to get some more information about community knowledge and perception of risk. So the county is going to help us do that. They're gonna run a couple of, of uh, convenient samples to help us to understand what people are really thinking instead of us making assumptions. Um, but we also know too that you know, having COVID and seeing how COVID is moving throughout our community is not unique to Milwaukee. What's happening here is happening in many countries across the nation because we're seeing an artifact of racist policies and practices that have played out over time. Where are people allowed to live? Where are people allowed to work? Mm -hmm. uh, what types of education? What types of access to fresh fruits and vegetables? You know, you can go down a list, these economic and social determinants of health and you see these things play out. So, you know, Milwaukee was one of the first, or should I say first, um, areas to share that data on um, race and ethnicity related to COVID. And when I started talking to other cities and saying, hey, what are you guys seeing? Because initially we were like, what's going on here? Like we thought it was like an event that people went to and that they got exposed to. That's normally what happens with epidemiology and public health. But no, they, once, you know, I started talking to other people, other health officers, they were like, well, we don't have that data, so we don't know. So they started like working on cleaning their data and sharing it. And sure enough, as they started sharing their information, then we started seeing this pattern across the country. Like for instance, in Chicago and in New York uh, and various boroughs, I think the Bronx, you're seeing the majority of the cases are Latinx. Mm -hmm. uh, versus like others where it's African-American, but nonetheless, you see the disparity playing out in many cities across the country. So what's happening right now with the protests and demonstrations and COVID is kind of like a perfect storm because it's gonna cause some change. Like there has to be a, a structural and systemic change that needs to take place to really dismantle some of these systems that are still playing out when we see this with a variety of other health issues. We see it with lead poisoning. We see it with obesity. We see it with violence. And you see the same heat map, same distributions. And then you go back to the old school redlining maps and you see where people are allowed to live. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very, um, this is a very powerful time that we're in right now. Um, I know it's a cause of a lot of emotions and um, anxiety and fear and anger and a number of other things. But you know, just encouraging everyone to, to, you know, take a moment to process what's going on and figure out your role in helping to make things better. So. Oh, we have a question. Um, Carol Kimball is asking, may I just say, Commissioner Kowalik, you are awesomeness. So proud to have you at the helm. Lead on with pride, love, passion, and BG magic. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's thank you, Carol, for that nice compliment to Commissioner Kowalik. Um, I really want to thank you both for coming on. Uh, you've answered a majority of the questions that I uh, had for you and the topics uh, that we had discussed earlier to speak about. Um, 
I, I do agree with you. You know, there are health disparities and systematic uh, issues that need to be addressed in order to fully move on uh, and to break down each level of these systemic issues, um, specifically targeting, you know, the Latino, uh, Latino OAX community and the, the African American community. Um, and let's not forget the Afro um, Latino o OAX community as well. Uh, they're definitely affected uh, right now by COVID-19 and police brutality as well. Um, so Angelina Salazar is asking, this is a question for Commissioner Kualik, is employment and the type of jobs residents on the South Side have a reason for the disproportionate number of positive cases on the South Side? So we knew initially that, that there was a connection there, but we need to do a formal analysis to make that connection. But, you know, like we had one yesterday um, that a business that voluntarily closed because they had an outbreak and the majority of the people that were infected were uh, Hispanic or Latinx. So, you know, we know, we know that by the type of work that people are, are subject to that they might be more at risk and even like feeling empowered at work. And if you see that you're not being set up like social distance or physical distance, or there's not adequate hand washing, or they're not wiping high touch surfaces down, or they really have everybody jammed in, like nothing's changed, mm -hmm. that there may be a lack of understanding that you have rights as an employee or a fear of being, you know, um, uh, retaliated against for whistleblowing. That's illegal to do that to, you know, if you, make a complaint, you shouldn't be retaliated against. But we know that it's some businesses don't operate that way. So that's why we have this, you know, reach out to the health department and we can investigate. We have received many photos, videos, you know, accounts of things that were not going on well at places. And sure enough, we were able to investigate and we saw some issues. So uh, we do take that to heart. Uh, uh, Deputy uh, Evers, her team, uh, they are on point, so they do follow up. And uh, Claire Evers has informed us that complaints um, are kept anonymous. So um, if you do uh, send an email to cehadadmin at milwaukee.gov uh, for reporting issues with employers and jobs on COVID-19, it is kept anonymous, so you do not have to worry about your identity being revealed. Um, a quick question. I understand we did talk about contact tracing, but we essentially didn't fully define it to the individuals that are watching right now. So can we define that real quick before we move on and you know conclude our interview for today? Sure. So there's actually multiple steps in this process. So. The first step is uh, case investigation. So that's if I'm positive and I have to talk to a public health nurse and the public health nurse is conducting an investigation. The second step is contacting all of the contacts. So they consider who's at risk, most at risk by the amount of time you've spent with the person that's positive and then the distance. So less than six feet, the amount of time we're still going with 10 minutes, mm -hmm. um, but if the CDC updated it to 15 minutes, but we're using the 10 because it's more on the side of caution and we're still like, hey, you know, we still have the majority of the cases in the state, so let's just stick with 10 for now. But those people that are considered high risk, those are the people that are notified as contacts. So then we're letting them know, one, you've been exposed to someone. We will never tell you who you were expo who exposed the virus because we're not allowed to legally, but you can kind of figure it out. Cause I know people talk, like we had some people revealing information on Facebook or whatever. They're like, I have COVID and it, you know, everybody's like running with it. So, you know, if that's their prerogative, they want to share their status, but we will never tell you uh, that it's even someone in your own house, unless it's like, a, you know, you're a dependent, like you're, parent child kind of relationship. Uh, once you're uh, notified as a contact, then we'll kind of walk through um, the dates of the window of exposure and then the quarantine that comes with that. 
So the quarantine is for 14 days, which is the incubation period for COVID-19. And you're basically monitoring if you develop any of the symptoms. The symptoms are expanded now, but they initially were like fever, 100.4 degrees or greater. Uh, now it's chills, body aches, sore throat, loss of taste and smell or smell, um, the coughing, shortness of breath, uh, and then headache is also another one that's added in there. Some people are having like uh, diarrhea or like um, GI issues. And then some people are also having like circulatory issues, like their hands and their feet, like they're um, having some issues there. So any of those, if you have at least one, uh, you definitely need to get tested. So, you know, this testing site at Umos is still available free of charge. Um, they also test people that don't have symptoms. So if you really want to know, you can go there too and still get tested regardless of having a symptom. Um, but you should also know that sometimes you might have the virus, but you can still spread it to other people if you don't have symptoms. So we're learning more about that, which is why we're trying to educate people about the mask wearing, why it's important because the mask really helps contain the virus if you happen to be a carrier. I mean, it can also protect you from breathing it in, but it's mainly for you to contain it. So if everybody wears a mask properly, meaning over the nose to the bottom of the chin, then that will significantly help reduce the spread of COVID-19. So we wanna make masks like a societal norm. We want people to embrace wearing masks as a, an accessory, you know, that this is what you do. So uh, now that more masks are available, there's more options. Well, thank you for that information. Uh, thank you to both of you, honestly, for coming on and explaining all of these different topics. Um, definitely, you know, we covered health disparities, um, systematic issues. We covered the Latinx population has a high increase in COVID-19. We've covered uh, contact tracing, lots of good information here that others need to know about. Um, is there anything else that both of you would like to add on before we conclude? Um, there is a federal benefit. I know everyone may not qualify, but I just want to put it out there that if you are, you do have COVID, you're supposed to get two weeks off of sick time paid. Um, so we can send that information to you. There's a Department of Labor um, flyer and it's in Spanish as well to make sure people know what their rights are. But also with this pilot program that we're preparing to roll out, where it also includes that the employer has to have a sick leave policy. So employees mm -hmm. are not being penalized or being forced to come into work and you're sick leave because you need the money. Like you should be able to quarantine at home or isolate at home without mm -hmm. it impacting you financially. Right. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely a huge issue for a lot of individuals today um, because it's seen as a privilege to be able to stay home during this time. Um, uh, but, you know, there are resources out there, like you just mentioned, and we will share those on our page uh, once we obtain them. But thank you both for your time, and um, it's been great talking to both of you. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. Um, so that was some vital information that we received from uh, Commissioner Kowalik and um, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Environmental, of Environmental Health. I need to memorize that one, mainly because uh, Claire Evers will be coming on the show bi-weekly to give us an update on COVID-19. And possibly we could discuss other um the related COVID-19 topics. Um, and then Dr. Jeanette Kowalik will be joining us once a month um, to give us a COVID-19 update as well. So you have two great resources available to you um, today. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Travis Hope with us here today. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're going to have a, a youth TikTok video that's going to play. It's our census update for today.
Well, that was a cute video and it was very informative. So essentially saying that none of your, uh, you know, your immigration status and no personal information of that sort will be taken into consideration when the census, when you fill out the census. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Travis Hope. He is a staff member at the Southside Organizing Center. He's going to give us a quick safety update for today. Hi, Travis. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Well, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great. So yeah, so um, District 2 didn't have a crime and safety meeting this month. Um, District 6 did. Um, and basically they're having a little uptick in some residential burglaries and auto thefts. So if you live in that area, um, please make sure your cars are locked up. And if you have a club or anything like that, make sure your garages are locked up. Um, anything like that. Don't leave nothing out that somebody else might potentially want to steal. Um, and also a big thing that's been going on right now, um, there's been a lot of fireworks going off. So if you hear the fireworks, call them in, the non-emergency number, 414-933-4444. Call them in, try to give an address if you can or the best location um, because they are in some cases getting out of hand, the fireworks. Um, some people saying they're going out for two hours at a time in their neighborhood. So it's important if if you want um, the police to respond or you want to stop, you know, um, please call um, and let them know that it's going on in your neighborhood because um, this is being seen all over the South Side area. Um, so it's important that we we call the police and we let them know because otherwise they're not going to know, right? Um, also, there's a couple projects going on in neighborhoods. Um, we're helping working one with the Walker Square um, neighborhood for the Love Your Block project. We're going to help um, revitalize a vacant lot and put some stuff on there. So stay tuned for that. We'll have more information. Um, it's just to beautify the lot and make it, you know, useful to the neighborhood instead of just a vacant lot where people dump stuff. So it is kind of like a safety and beautification. Oh, there's a the couple projects going on in neighborhoods. Um, where we're also, um, the in the Walker Square neighbor park neighborhood, also the active street that's going on, the neighborhood association is working with another group to do like exercise in there every Wednesday at six o'clock. They meet at Walker Square Park and they're going to try to activate the streets that are kind of blocked off with signage, letting people know that um, there are neighbors doing activities on these streets. So, if you can make it to that, come check that out. Um, also in the Walker's Point area, we're working with an art project that's called Soy Can Soy. And it's, it's a beautiful project It takes painting and it, it puts the neon on top of it. And it's just a beautiful project. So you can go to the uh, Zocalo Facebook page and you can check that out. That's gonna be on Six and Pierce. And there's a great video on there. There's two artists working on that. Um, Isabel and Tom, and they just did a great job. There's a great video showing them make it. So they also have a GoFundMe. They're trying to get it on there. It's going to be real inspirational. Um, it's real nice. And also, if you do donate, um, there's a chance to win one of the artworks. So it's just it's just a great thing. You should check it out. Um, and let me see what else. Oh, on 13th Street, I know earlier this year, I kind of talked about a survey we we're doing for 13th Street, the safety uh, intersections. And they're working on it now. So your surveys, what you did put in your surveys did count. So just keep, you know, looking if other stuff pops up in other neighborhoods, those type of surveys, please take them because it is important because um, the crosswalks are getting painted right now on Harrison and Cleveland. They're getting repainted the first time in probably years. So there's going to be a lot of other things coming up. So it's just important to really pay attention, get involved. Um, if you ever want to get involved in any type of neighborhood things, you can always contact SOC. And um, we can help you with that. So yeah, I think um, uh, I think that's about it. So you know, it's good to see you guys again. Haven't been out for a while. Um, well, well, you're welcome to come on. Thank you. Uh, yep. Your information, but thank you for that. Thank you, and Travis. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, so next, um, we're going to have our sock promo for today. So it's going to be the daily survey. Um. 
Hi Community Forum, reminding you of our daily $25 gift certificate drawing by filling out the survey located in the comments section. In the following day's forum, we'll announce the winner. It's a quick five question survey and you can enter daily and win daily. Thanks for those of you who have been filling them out and thanks for tuning in. Now let's find out who's today's winner. Today's winner is Maria Mendez. So that's the winner, congratulations. And uh, now we're going to uh, play our thank you video for today that was made by one of our resident associations uh, participants. Um, but thank you for joining us today. I hope you gained lots of information from today's forum and we'll see you again tomorrow. Hello, SOG viewers. My name is Angel Hope and I'm a youth organizer at SOC. We would like to thank everyone for supporting our three o'clock at SOC Live and for completing our SOC survey. In addition to that, we would also like to thank our sponsors, Wisconsin Voices, Community Development Block Grants, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructure Fund, Movement Voter Project, Catholic Campaign for Human Development, Zilber Foundation, the City of Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, Tides Foundation, City of Milwaukee Promise Zones, all and all the faithful individuals who support SOC through their personal donations. Thank you.